This is Andrea Malquist interviewing Daniel Riley on May the 5th, 2014 at Fountaindale Public Library. We're also joined by his daughter Maureen Riley here in the room with us. So I guess we can begin by discussing some of your background. When and where were you born? I'm sorry. Oh, that's I okay. I couldn't hear you. We're going to start with a little bit of your background. Okay. Could you tell us when and where you were born? I was born on May 21st, 1920 in Buffalo, New York. Okay. Uh, who uh, were your parents and what were their occupations? Uh, my mother was a housekeeper. <laughs> I okay. mean, she was a, a housewife. Uh, my father was a hotel manager. Thanks. Did you have any siblings? Uh, I was the oldest of five children. There were two other boys and two girls. Okay. Uh, what were their names? Well, uh, Larry Lawrence, he was the next, and then Betty Ann and um, Mary Jane and Billy. Billy is still alive. Uh, the other three are gone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, did, did any of them serve in the military? I'm sorry? Did any of them serve in the military as well? <coughs> yes. Uh, Larry was a, a first lieutenant in uh, uh, combat engineers. Oh, wow. Uh, what were you doing before the service? I was working in the steel mills and going to college, DePaul University, uh, in Chicago. Here in Chicago. Okay. And in what branch of the military did you serve? In what branch of the military did you serve? I was in the Army Air Force. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. You were drafted. Okay. Um, and can you describe what happened when you departed for training camp and your early days of training? <clears throat> well, I remember we, uh, we had a meet in front of the library in, on 75th Street, in uh, Eastern, East 75th Street in Chicago. And uh, they took us on the streetcar to the railroad station. And from there, we went to Camp Grant, which was in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, we went through our preliminary uh, tests, uh, the physical tests and mental tests and so on, took the general classification test there, which I scored very highly on. Uh, and uh, then I went to uh, Jefferson Barracks, <coughs> Missouri, outside of St. Louis, for uh, basic training. And I was there for uh, three months. And from there, I came right back to Chicago, <coughs> where I spent three months in uh, uh, Chicago School of Aircraft Instruments, which was... Uh, had been taken over by the Army Air Force. And that's where I learned how to work on, on the aircraft instruments, which actually became part of my life uh, after the war. Uh, after I finished there, uh, I was sent to uh, New Orleans Army Air Base <coughs> for Thanksgiving of 1945. Uh, it was only there a short time when I went to Tampa, Florida, <coughs> where I was assigned to my squadron. We were only in Tampa a short time. Uh, well, we'd hardly gotten there when I got to have an unexpected two-week furlough over Christmas, which was something I never expected. <laughs> and, uh, of course, having just been married, that was a happy happy thing. Uh, by the time the furlough was over, the squadron had moved to uh, Green, Greenville, North Car South Carolina. And uh, 
actually it was during that time I, I don't remember now whether I was still in Tampa or in Greenville uh, when they sent me to turret school in Indianapolis and I spent uh, 11 weeks <coughs> there up until Easter of 1943. Uh, that was a traumatic time because <coughs> I got home quite frequently, fortunately, from from Indianapolis to Chicago, uh, but uh, had arranged range for my wife, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> arranged for my wife to come down and stay near the school, which was at the fairgrounds in Indianapolis, uh, for Easter when I was told that I was called back to my squadron, which is why I only had 11 weeks instead of 12 weeks. But uh, I was so far ahead in the classes that I still graduated in the turret school. Uh, my, my baggage was already packed up at Greenville when, we got, when I got back there. And the next day we left for Camp Shanks New York, that's just outside of the city in New York. And we were only there for a couple of days, I believe, <coughs> when we shipped out. Uh, had my one and only view of the Statue of Liberty from <coughs> the Aquitania. That was an interesting trip because the Aquitania was the sister ship of the Lusitania and the Mauritania. It was an enormous ship for those days. Uh, has since been scrapped, of course, but uh, it was uh, filled with not only American soldiers going to Europe, but uh, English soldiers, uh, soldiers from New Zealand, from uh, Australia, and many, <coughs> uh, what I call them, Sikhs, the, uh, uh, Indian from India, and many of them with their big turbans on in uniform. So we uh, crossed the Atlantic without a, what did they call those things, where they, the ships that all go together, uh, because this was so big and fast a ship, uh, they weren't in convoy. Mm -hmm. So we crossed, had to cross all alone but also to avoid uh, the possibility of being uh, torpedoed, which incidentally there was a report <laughs> that the Germans put out that we had been torpedoed, which we hadn't. But I guess we zigzagged all over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I was told at one time we were down near the Azores, but we finally landed on about May 19th at uh, Greenock, England, which is just outside of Glasgow, or not England, Scotland, okay. uh, after a very interesting trip. I can remember coming out of the lower areas after watching a movie or something at 11 o'clock at night and seeing the sun still up, so we were that far north. <laughs> uh, from... Uh, Glasgow, we traveled by train to uh, Oxfordshire, where we went directly to Dorchester. Dorchester was uh, eight miles from Oxford, and uh, our base was called Mount Farm. Uh, the reason it was called Mount Farm is because it belonged to uh, Lord Mountbatten, who was one of the top officers in the British Army or Navy at that time. Uh, I was, uh, I, I don't know what, to, to, to how much more you want me to say right now, oh, okay. whether you want me to go on telling about that or? Uh, well, I do have some more questions for you as well. I do have some more questions for you as well. Just go on from there. Uh, well, could you tell us a little bit about how you adapted to military life? Okay. The physical regimen, the barracks, the food, social life. 
Well, it was pretty easy for me. <clears throat> uh, first of all, my dad had been a captain in the war, uh, Army in World War I. And, uh, well, he wasn't really much of a military man. He had uh, drilled my brothers and me in uh, military drill and, uh, you know, the attention, right turn, left turn, uh, left face, and all those things. Uh, which I also, when they started trying to teach us that stuff in the Army, I already knew it all. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also, I had joined the Boy Scouts at age 12 in 1932. And uh, in those days, the Boy Scouts, uh, they dressed like military and they had a lot of, a lot of the things that we did were sort of based on military things in those days. So, uh, and I was used to being away at home, camping and things like that. So uh, the adjustment to military life was not difficult for me as it was very traumatic for many others. <clears throat> Certainly. Uh, were, did you serve on the front lines at all? No, I was never actually on the front lines. Okay. Uh, I was very fortunate because uh, uh, our base uh, was a photo reconnaissance base. Uh, all of the airplanes, none of the airplanes had guns in them. They all had cameras. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of our planes were lightnings. Those were those twin boom planes. Uh, the uh, P-38. But we also had uh, a lot of uh, British Spitfires, which were a good plane for having cameras in them. Uh, our planes were so fast that they didn't, they, they'd always go alone. When they, they never went over in, in convoy like the uh, uh, bombers did, they always went in large groups with uh, fighter planes running protection on them. But our planes were so fast that they would just singly go over and take their pictures and come back until near the end of the war when the uh, Germans were getting some faster planes. Uh, they decided we needed some Mustangs, P-51 Mustangs. And uh, in the meantime, the new K-14 gun sight had been developed which nobody knew anything about except its name. And I was sent to school for, uh, for that. Um, so I would, uh, except for the pilots that knew how to use it, I was the only one on our base that knew anything about the K-14 gun sight. Uh, I was, you know, couldn't tell anybody about it or anything, but I installed them in uh, several of our Mustangs. I don't know that they ever used them because that was in February of uh, 1945. And of course, just a few months later, the war was over. Uh, we never were too cognizant of what the uh, uh, activities on the base were. I mean, which flights there were or anything, because as a service squadron, uh, we weren't closely connected with the uh, operational squadrons. Um, okay. um, <clears throat> what kind of friendships and camaraderie did you form while serving? I'm sorry? What kind of friendships and uh, camaraderie did you form while serving and with whom? Well, being as we were, uh, sort of a permanent location, we didn't move around much. Uh, and we weren't ch changed much. Basically, we were mostly the same people all the time for the two and a half years we were over there. Uh, we got to make a lot of friends. And uh, I, one of my friends became uh, my daughter Maureen's, uh, uh, or no, it was the other way around, I guess. Uh, she was my, my oldest son's uh, godfather, godfather uh, after we came home. Uh, Leo Rorig, who was uh, in my squadron, uh, not in my squadron, but also in my uh, 
in the same shop. Uh, see, we were, our squadron had individual shops. As an air service squadron, we had shops for all the different jobs that might be necessary. We had our own uh, body shop and uh, engine for working on the engines. Uh, then our own shop was the uh, instrument shop. Uh, we also handled the oxygen tanks that had to be, that they had to have in each plane. And that was a problem we had there because we got the oxygen tanks from the British and uh, they came in different tanks than we had and they had different fittings. So I remember my boss at that time, Master Sergeant Andreessen, had to make fittings that would adapt so that we could take the oxygen out of the British tanks and put them in our own tanks. Because these British tanks were about six feet long and we put them in little bottles, we called them, about so big that went into the airplane. And uh, that took some tricky stuff too because we had to have a special room where we transferred that because, you know, oxygen can be very dangerous. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yes. How did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? Well, of course, they, uh, we had the, uh, what do they call it? Uh, V-mail, I think they call it. Uh, we wrote letters home. And that's the only way, I mean, there were no, no cell phones, of course, in those mm -hmm. days. And the only way we had contact was by letters. And uh, mail was, for us, it was pretty good, because as I say, we lived sort of normal lives uh, there on the base. It wasn't like being at the front. Uh, we had our regular hours of work. Uh, we were usually off at night, and Ed could, could go into... Uh, and our uh, forays into Oxford or into Dorchester or Abingdon or one of the other towns. And everybody rode a bicycle. Everybody, one of the first things you did when you got there was buy a bicycle. And so you didn't have to wait to get somebody else to drive you. You just went every place uh, on your own. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times I rode the bike alone into and back home from Oxford, the eight miles. But uh, we, uh, I was even able to send books home. I, being near Oxford, I uh, got to many bookstores and uh, accumulated a lot of books. I'm quite a reader, and so was my wife. And so I sent something like 200 books home, and she received every one of them in spite of the possibilities of getting lost because of of the war, planes being shot down or uh, boats being sunk. Hmm. Where were you when the war ended? I'm sorry? Where were you when the war ended? When the war ended? Oh, when the were war you, ended. Were you still in Oxford? Well, we were still there on that base. Okay. Um, when the war ended in Europe, um, in fact, there were two or three months there that we didn't have much to do, and uh, I had an opportunity to fly over to uh, Normandy for a couple of days, uh, ostensibly to do some work on a plane, because we had a courier base there, uh, and actually, they didn't, they just wanted me to have a chance to get away from having nothing to do except maybe drill work at our camp. Uh, so I uh, had the opportunity to uh, go and practice my French because, you see, the USO made possible for, and the Army itself, for us to take courses and things in our spare time uh, because we couldn't very well, you know, enroll in a school or something. And uh, one of the courses that they uh, had up uh, available was to learn the French language. Mm. Uh, well, my new wife uh, uh, 
he spoke French and I didn't. I spoke German. And uh, so I thought, well, this was a good opportunity for me to learn it. So I managed to actually master the French language during the time I was over there. And uh, this little trip to Normandy was my first opportunity, my only opportunity, actually, uh, to, uh, to get to speak with somebody that didn't speak English at all, uh, which I took advantage of because I went to church and went to confession, and uh, uh, it was a, quite an experience. In fact, it made all the difference because whenever I had a chance to speak French in Oxford, which I had often because they're one of these friends that I made was the teacher, uh, he'd be with me in Oxford and try to get me to talk to people there, and I'd clam up until after I'd had my time in, in Normandy uh, where when I apologized for my French. I was told not to apologize because I could speak French, but he couldn't speak English. And that uh, after that, I never had any trouble. So, How but I, I made a lot of friends in, in Oxford too, though. Okay. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I have no documentation for this, but I know that I met J.R.R. Tolkien because he went to the same church that I went to when I was in Oxford the Jesuit church there. And of course, he wasn't known at that time, but I just remember meeting him among some other men. Wow. Um, how, how did you return home? Uh, according to some reports, I came back on the same boat I went over on, but that's not true. Uh, I guess some of our people did. But uh, we... Uh, we shipped out around the 1st of August from uh, York, or around York in northern, near northern England, uh, on the Cornelius Gilliam. The Cornelius Gilliam was a liberty ship. Uh, liberty ships were ships that were built just for the war. Okay. And uh, they were used for transporting materials and things and personnel, but they were pretty small. Now, there were thousands of people on the Aquitania when we went over. Coming back, there weren't more than about 200 of us on that board, board that ship. So we were uh, coming home. We didn't have to worry about uh, submarines because the war in Europe was over. But uh, we were supposed to come home, have some f recreational time, and then go to the Pacific. Uh, so this was early in August that we're crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, though I don't know how fast they cross it these days, but it wasn't very fast then. It took us over two weeks. Uh, while we were aboard ship, both of the atom bombs were dropped in uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the war in Japan actually ended during that time. So uh, uh, one of my jobs on board ship was to handle Catholic uh, uh, services on Sunday. And uh, so we had a, uh, a joint Catholic, Jewish, and Protestant uh, service, Thanksgiving service, for the end of the war. And I conducted the Catholic part of that service. But it's pretty uh, memorable, the fact that that's where we were at that time. Uh, I might mention that uh, on the 12th of August, which is the night of the uh, uh, big display in the sky every year of the, uh, uh, what do they call them, Maureen? Perseids. The Perseids, yeah. Uh, the display of, uh, meteor display. Uh, I came out on board the, on the deck that night, and of course there's no lights anyplace except on our ship, and there's the vast sky just covered with shooting stars. Yeah. It was uh, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. 
So, how did you readjust to civilian life? I'm sorry? How did you readjust to civilian life? Well, uh, it wasn't bad. Uh, my wife, of course, of three days when I went in the service, and now two years was waiting for me. And uh, we, uh, we had about three months while I was still in the service. But you see, we were supposed to, as I said, we were supposed to have gotten ready and gone out to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And because of the end of the war, uh, that changed everything. So they had so many people they had to take care of that it was, see, that was August. It was November. I, I did have to go back after a couple of weeks to Camp Grant, but they sent me home again. So it was actually November before I was discharged. Uh, my wife and I got to go for a delayed honeymoon up into uh, uh, Wisconsin. And uh, I got to get familiar with her family and things. and. Uh, it was a happy time. Uh, after that, I returned to uh, DePaul University and uh, ultimately graduated from there. Uh, I also returned to the steel mills uh, where I had been before. And uh, because of the instrument work, that I did, I was uh, talked into. Well, I didn't. They didn't have to talk very hard uh, in uh, taking an apprenticeship in instrumentation in the steel mills, and I eventually became the instructor, and in fact, in charge of the whole instrument program in our at South Works U.S. Steel. But that's because of having been in instrumentation in the service. How did your wartime experiences affect your life? Well, that's 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 hard to say. I I'm, I'm sure they did affect my, my life. I made some lifetime friends, friendships. Uh, of course, having learned French, I have eventually got a degree in French from DePaul University. Uh, and I still read French, and almost all of my prayers are in French. Uh, and that was has been important to me. And my wife and I got to communicate a lot that way, and a lot in, in, in reading of French books and things. Um, the things I learned, of course, uh, especially in instrumentation, that had a profound effect on my life. Uh, it, it really, I wish I'd gotten even this more thought ahead of time. Oh, that's okay. That's uh, not a problem. What message would you like to leave for future generations who may hear this interview. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Is there any message that you would want to leave for future generations that may listen or watch this interview? Well, for future generations, I would say love one another. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make it impossible for future wars, because another war after what they've learned, technology and everything with atoms and so on, uh, that'll be the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, got a, we've got a lot of long way to go to learn to be friends when we see all the problems that are going on in the world today with uh, the wars that continue in in the various countries and the, the hatred that is unnecessary. Uh, people have got to love one another and really, really do so in such a way that they can live happily together.
Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? The one thing that I think about, I had a pretty easy life over there compared with the fellows in the troops and the, uh, the infantry and those who were in the trenches. Mm. But I did have one experience that nearly cost me my life. I found it necessary at one time to go back up to where our school had been uh, uh, on these K-14 gun sites. And we were on a flight in a Cessna, a twin-engine Cessna. Uh, that's a rather small passenger plane. There weren't more than about eight of us aboard. And the pilot was a warrant officer rather than a full officer. Uh, we were traveling, coming back to Oxford or to our base from uh, up near Liverpool when the uh, pilot told us we'd flown off our maps. We only had maps that went as far as our base, but because of a tailwind, he didn't notice we had gone further and he wasn't sure where we were, which would have been fine except that our radio wasn't working. Uh, we had an officer aboard, uh, a young officer who'd only been on our base a short time, and uh, his rank ran away with him, I guess. He wouldn't let the uh, warrant officer flying the plane listen to anybody. Uh, I recognized a road that we crossed over, and I said, if we follow that road, it'll take us right back home. This officer wouldn't allow them to listen to me. So uh, so we had to go on flying south. This is February. It got dark. It wasn't like that time when we saw the sun at uh, 11 o'clock at night. Um, we are try, try flying south in a small plane, running out of gas, no radio. Well, it turned out that people were hearing us on their radios. We just couldn't receive them. And we saw some flares off in the distance that turned out to be Aldershot, which was a British uh, officer training camp. But as we turned toward those flares, lights came on on a base, a very small air base almost just below us. And so... There were landing field there, so we went and landed. And it turned out that this was a small British uh, air base who had been hearing our, heard our cries for help, you might say. And uh, so they put their lights on, which normally they wouldn't have done. Mm. Well, we found out that just a few more minutes we had been out over the English Channel with no gas and... Well, we, we'd have been gone. Wow. They took care of us. They uh, gave us a bed for the night, let us go in and had they prepared food for us and gave us gas so we could get back to our base the next day. But that's the closest that I ever came to. And I didn't really realize until later how close it was. Wow. Daniel, I thank you so much for coming in today.